Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, early CRM Applied Math Seminar. And we're uh, very happy to uh, host Sebastian Ludigabel from uh, Ecole Polytechnique today. Uh, Sebastian received a PhD in 2008 uh, under uh, Charles O'Day at Ecole Polytechnique. And then he went on to do a uh, postdoc stints at IBM and uh, University of Chicago, whose unofficial motto uh, I recently learned is where fun goes to die. And uh, now uh, he's, been a, he's been a professor at Polytechnique uh, since 2011. And uh, he's gonna talk about uh, black box optimization and uh, related software, which is uh, his, uh, special field of interest. Thank you very much, uh, Tim, for the invitation. And sorry for the change of uh, hour, because I have my karate lesson. Oh. In fact, my son's karate lesson is tonight at 5, so I, I could not do it at uh, 4. So uh, what I, I'm going to present today is uh, what I do in research in the black box optimization. Uh, in fact, what we do as a team with my uh, colleagues. Um, I'm also part of uh, the Gerard uh, Research Center in optimization. And uh, first, before beginning, I want to acknowledge my contributors and partners, so NSERC, uh, but also IVADO, and uh, Innove, Innove is the provincial uh, agency for uh, electrical energy. But also we have some uh, industrial partners, Hydro-Québec, Rio Tinto, and currently uh, Huawei Canada. Uh, so this is a, a team. Uh, we are two professors, Charles Zodé and myself. We have uh, one research associate, Christophe, and a bunch of students that you can see uh, uh, in this page. Um, so many of them work on this uh, algorithm and everything that we do uh, ends up in the software that we call uh, Nomad. And so my presentation is going to present this software. So first, uh, I'm going to introduce what is the, the field of black box optimization and derivative-free optimization. I'll then present the MADS algorithm and the software Nomad. And I, I'm going to give an example of an application of uh, the optimization of the upper parameters of uh, neural networks. So uh, what is black box optimization? In fact, black box and derivative-free optimization. So we want to minimize a function f of x subject to a, a set of constraints omega. And what is uh, the nature of, of, what is the black box nature of this problem is that the, the functions, the, the objective function and the ones that define the set of constraints are typically the output of a black box. So what is a black box? It's a simulation. It's a program, something that is going to compute uh, with numerical methods, but something that you cannot access. So you don't know the internals of the, uh, or the mechanisms of this black box. You give it an X and eventually it's going to give you back uh, F of X and uh, the, the constraints. Also each call to the simulation may be expensive. So we have some examples where the one call to the black box takes two days and maybe after two days going just to crash. Um, sometimes it's not even a function. So it means that uh, you give it a one X, but you, if you give it the same X a while after, it's not going to give you the same output. So there are some stochasticity involved. Also, and the most important point is that you cannot access to any derivative information. So if you want to use a method that is based on derivatives to optimize these functions, these kind of functions, it's not going to be possible because of, of the lack of derivatives. So you have to use derivative-free optimization methods. Um, this slide, in fact, comes from um, a Boeing engineer from, uh, from 2009. And it's a nice illustration of what is a black box. So you have the long run time. It can take a lot of memory. It can fail. Uh, you can have a many local optima, some, some noise, but the most important is that, is that you don't have access to any derivative information. Um, Charles O'Day with uh, Warren Hare, they wrote a book in uh, 2017 about uh, this field, about uh, derivative-free and black box optimization. And he, 
in terms of terms, uh, here is the definition of derivative free optimization versus black box optimization. So in, in two words, derivative free optimization is when you don't have access to the derivatives that maybe they exist. And black box optimization is when usually you don't have the, the derivative that does, do, do not exist. So you are not going to be able to even try, try to approximate the derivatives with like finite, finite difference. So that's the difference between the two, but it's very close. In fact, um, uh, I did this sketch of uh, what are the different optimization methods. Uh, on the left, you have the continuous problems. On the right, the discrete problems. And uh, if you are at the center of uh, this uh, ellipse, uh, it's linear programming. But the more outside of the ellipse you go, the more difficult the problem is. So if you go to uh, just outside the linear programming, then this is a non-linear programming, but you, are, you still have derivatives. But after that, you don't have access to any derivatives. Uh, I don't know if a black box convex function exists, but uh, according to this graph, this is possible. But honestly, I, I, I don't know if it's possible. Um, so my research lies in the two most uh, external ellipses on this graph. So now that the problem is uh, set, I can talk a bit about the, the algorithm, the method that we developed at Poly since uh, 20 years almost. So uh, first, this is a typical setting of a, of a method for a black box optimization. You have your black box on the, on the, on the bottom and you have uh, the algorithm on top of it, which is going to iterate and produce some uh, points, candidates to give to the, to the black box and get back the result from the black box. And it's going to iterate and, uh, and at the end, it's going to, to give you back one proposed solution. So this is a list of uh, like a check, uh, a perfect checklist of what you want to, uh, to have with a method for black box optimization. So there are a lot of items, but ideally it should be efficient given a limited budget of evaluations. So given that each evaluation is possibly cost, costing a lot, you want to minimize the number of evaluations to the black box. It must be robust to noise and uh, failures. So you don't want the method to crash if one evaluation is going to crash also. It, because it's concerned with real problems and real applications have constraints, you have to deal with constraints, not just one objective function. Also, um, it, it will be nice to, to deal with multi-objective optimization. Not, ju not just one objective. Also integers and uh, categorical variables. So the application example that I have at the end is about uh, hyperparameters. So here we have a lot of categorical variables. Uh, it's also nice to have some uh, possible parallelism because it's expensive. So you, if you have access to a cluster, it's nice to evaluate your black box in, uh, in parallel. It, you have to provide an implementation and ideally a publicly available, available implementation of your algorithm. So this is what uh, Nomad does. And what, we, what I want to stress today is that uh, the method that we, we develop have convergence properties. So we don't want to develop heuristics such as uh, genetic algorithm, for example. We want our methods to be ensured to give you a good result and if we, if we begin to make some assumptions on the nature of the problem, for example, if you assume that um, the problem is differentiable, then we want to ensure that the methods are going to give you a local optimum. The, uh, the reasoning behind this is why do you want to use a method that is not going to give you a local optimum, uh, local optimum on, a, on an easy problem? Why do you want to use that? a heuristic, for example, on a difficult problem. You want to be sure that at least for an easy problem, you are going to achieve a local optimum. So that's the philosophy of, our, of what we develop at Polytechnic. Uh, there are many different families of methods for these problems. First, uh, so this is my own categorization of uh, methods. First, the like the computer science methods, such as heuristics, uh, for example, genetic algorithms, um, they, they may be very efficient, but they don't have any convergence property and they cost a lot of evaluations. 
In fact, sometimes it's very efficient, but that should be the last resort solution. So I don't know if you know um, Andy Cohn. He was a, he was a, a researcher in, in my field of derivative free optimization, but also in optimization in general. And he's, he used to say that uh, genetic algorithms are either for the disparate of all the inherent. So that was a nice citation from him. Um, after that, you have the statistical methods, such as the design of experiments, but this is obviously a very old. But more recently, uh, you have the emergence of Bayesian optimization methods. So these methods are, are more and more popular. But so far, they, they lack a bit of in terms of uh, performance. Uh, so they don't deal with constraints, for example, and they have they are um, they cannot succeed with a lot of variables. So we think that is it's good to use this kind of methods in conjunction with uh, derivative full optimization methods. And so you have this uh, third family, the, the the derivative free optimization, and in this family you have two subfamilies: the model based method and the direct search method. So model-based uh, derivative-free optimization methods are usually based on quadratic models or radial basis functions, and they use a trust region. Uh, in practice, they are better for uh, derivative-free optimization where you know that the function is uh, differentiable, but you don't have access to the derivatives. And they are not so easy to parallelize. So, what I consider in my research is a direct search method called MADS for mesh adaptive direct search. And there are other methods, but MADS is the most recent one. Um, in general, for all these methods, what uh, you can solve uh, as, um, as problems is typically uh, around 50 to 100 variables, but no more. After that, you have to use some uh, decomposition methods or, or other methods. So, uh, if I want to illustrate what is uh, what is MAD, my method, uh, the best is to show an illustration on a, on a 2D case here. So for two variables uh, only, uh, what we consider is a discretization of the space uh, with a mesh that you can see here. And based on the current iterate xk, we are going to generate some directions and generate some candidates at the with this direction. So here, three candidates, and we are going to evaluate the candidates at, at this uh, with the black box. And if it's a failure, if the, the evaluations uh, at the three candidates point is not better than the current evaluation, then we are going to reduce the size of the mesh in order to get uh, the next iterates closer to the current iterate. So in this example, the first step on the left was a failure. So after that, in the center, we are going to try the function closer to, the, to xk. Um, in case this is still a failure, then we are going to do that again and to, it, to evaluate closer again. But you, you can see here that there are, in fact, two meshes, two, um, two uh, levels of meshes. And what we want to do is to generate directions on the intersection of these two meshes. And because one of the mesh is reducing faster than the other, the number of possibilities is going to, to grow more and more. So what, what this gives us is the possibility to generate some directions that are going to, to form a dense set in, the, in, the, in two dimension here. So if you look at uh, one optimization, uh, performed by the algorithm, and you consider all the directions that were used during the optimization, and you look at this direction with the same norm, then you are going to fill the space. So maths is going to generate directions uh, like that are going to look everywhere in the space. So this is the main principle of the method. Here, what I showed is a, a, a succession of failures because the convergence theory is based on that. So it means that if the, the xk point is a local minimum, then you are going to, uh, to, to, to get your mesh to zero. And the convergence on the, of the method is based on this, where when the mesh is going to zero. 
So it means that you have a local minimum. But if you have a success, if let's say in the center that, uh, I don't know, uh, T6, I don't know if you see my mouse here, my pointer, do you see it? Okay. If you, uh, if for example, T6 is a success, meaning that the point here is better, then we are going to, we are going to move here and to increase the size of the mesh and to begin again. So the, the main principle of the method is very simple. It's just generate directions that are going to form a dense set of directions and to reduce or increase the size of the mesh. If you put that into a, an algorithm, it, look like, it looks like this. So what I just showed is a pole. So pole means that you are going to pull the space around the current iterate. And this is this part. So the illustration that I just showed is this part in the algorithm. So it means uh, you have to construct a set of candidates here, PK, uh, given some directions, DK. You can sort these points and you evaluate these points, but opportunis opportunistically. It means that uh, as soon as you have a success, you stop the sequence of evaluations to go to the next iteration. So it's why it's important to sort the point so that the most promising points are evaluated first. But in this method, you can also add the, this step that, that we call the search step, which consists to generate a, a number of a finite number of mesh points. So some points on the mesh, but you can use whatever method you want to use. So if you have some knowledge about your problem, you can insert this knowledge into this step, or you can use some, uh, some other methods here, such as uh, uh, Bayesian optimization methods could be uh, introduced here. So that's the flexible part of the method. So this part is very rigid uh, based on directions, but the convergence of the methods is um, dependent on this. So it's why it's more rigid, but this part, the search part is more flexible and it allows to, uh, to design a very efficient method, in fact. And this second part is, is, is just the updates. So as soon as, as you have a success, you increase the size of the mesh. So delta k is the size of the mesh. If you don't have any success, then you are going to decrease the size of the mesh and go on, right? Is it OK? OK, so uh, this is a list of features that we have in uh, the current version of the method. So uh, MADS, in fact, dates from uh, 2006 the basic algorithm. And uh, since that time, uh, we worked a lot. In fact, all of our research is concerned with math and we add uh, features into it, the algorithm. So with the time, we added some uh, uh, different techniques to handle uh, constraints. We included surrogates. Uh, I don't know if you know what is a surrogate. Uh, it's like a model of the function. So a simplification of the function, but it, that is a uh, very, uh, 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 cheap to, uh, to evaluate. We, we deal with categorical variables. Also, what, what, we, have, uh, what we had recently is uh, granular variables. So granular variables are variables for which you can control the number of decimals. This is very uh, uh, practical. We have some parallel methods, some multi-objective optimization methods. We have some sensitivity, sensitivity analysis uh, tools. And more recently also, we, uh, we are dealing with stochastic black boxes. So how to deal with black box that are not going to give you the same answer every time you, you call them. Okay, so now that, now that I have presented the, the, the algorithm, I want to go to the software that implements uh, this uh, method. So uh, NOMAD stands for nonlinear non -linear optimization with uh, MADS. So it may be confusing sometimes, but the NOMAD is the software and MADS is the algorithm. So this is an implementation in C++ of MADS. Uh, it's standard C++, so it runs on uh, every platform. It's totally standalone. There are no external libraries. It's parallel with MPI and uh, NOAA also uh, with uh, OpenNP. We have some uh, MATLAB versions and uh, interfaces with uh, Python and uh, uh, mostly, mostly Python, but also Excel. Uh, it's free and uh, open. You, you can see the address here. Uh, if you Google uh, Nomad optimization, you are going to find it anyway. And we have a faster support at this address. Uh, there is a paper that is specifically dedicated to, no, to the software, to Nomad, 
uh, it's published in terms. Uh, terms is for uh, transaction and mathematical software. And this is a nice logo of Nomad. And this image, in fact, comes from a, a paper from Charles O'Day in the Siam uh, uh, optimization uh, journal of optimization. It's called the Kaneway function. I think that if you would if you went to the um, Siam optimization conferences, I guess that you have seen this image already because it's taken from Nomad. So the Siam folks they took the image for their conferences. In fact. Some history about uh, Nomad. So Nomad is developed since uh, 2000. So way before Mad was in um, uh, was uh, developed. In fact, so uh, before Mad, Nomad already existed and implemented another method. Uh, these are our current versions. So recently, we uh, we we wrote a new version of the code, and uh, we started from scratch. So we it's a big move for us. So to go from version three to version four. So it's why we still have the two versions that are still proposed. Uh, these are the the names of the people that were um, involved in the coding of Nomad. So I'm still here, and uh, Charles is, st is still here, and this is our current research associate. Um, this is a graph of the, of the downloads of Nomad uh, since uh, uh, 2008. So here we can see that what is the scale of, the, of this uh, software. So it's almost, it's more than 10,000 people that use it regularly. So we have some uh, forms. Every time you, you want to download Nomad, you have to fill a form. And uh, so we can see who you are exactly if you want to let us know. And so we can know what uh, people are doing with Nomad. Also, we know uh, where these people are from. So they are mostly from academia, but also a lot from uh, the industry. So the main functionality that we have in Nomad uh, are the possibility to treat single or B objective uh, optimization objectives. We are able to deal with a lot of different types of uh, variables, such as continuous, of, of course, but also integer, binary, categorical, and granular variables. Uh, our variables can be periodic. We can, we can also fix some variables very easily or define some groups of variables. Uh, the flexible part of the method, uh, the search uh, step of MADS, that uh, we can propose some uh, already coded searches, such as uh, sampling, like uh, Latin hypercube, but also some more evolved uh, methods, such as variable neighborhood search. So I don't know if you know this uh, meta heuristic, but it's uh, it's uh, something that is very useful to um, for multimodal functions. So when you have uh, many local op optima, you can uh, enable this uh, search, and it's going to try to escape from local optima. We also have some uh, an elder mid search. So an elder mid is another method very efficient. So, but you can couple this method with MAD. So it's a mix between elder mid and MAD. So an elder mid is coded in the search of MAD, and it's it's very very efficient. We have quadratic models and statistical surrogates, uh, such as Bayesian Bayesian model are integrated into uh, surrogates that Nomad can use. Also, of course, you can define your own search strategy if you know some uh, uh, properties of your problem. Then you can include this knowledge into the into the software. Uh, we treat the constraints with uh, four different strategies. Uh, the most efficient is the pro is what we call the progressive barrier. So it's a filter method, in fact, where uh, you can accept some uh, points that are not feasible but you are going to move through the infeasible space. And it's, it's also very efficient to find some feasible points. We have a lot of different uh, direction types. And uh, our most uh, efficient directions are called orthomads. So it means that our directions are orthogonal. Um, OK, uh, I wanted also to uh, just to explain a bit uh, about the use of Nomad. So how does it work in practice if you want to optimize a black box? So Nomad is, a, is not a, a program with a GUI. Uh, it's a command line program. And for a black box that, is a, that has the same format that is working on the command line, you can use Nomad. So it can be coded in any language. So because it's, a, it's an external uh, um, program, you can plug Nomad with this external program, whatever the language of this program is. So typically, 
the black box is like a, a bb.exe. It's going to consider a point where uh, x point is uh, described and it's going to display the objective function and for this example, two constraints. If you have that, if your, pro, if your black, box, black box can be put in with this format, then you can use Nomad on it. So this is an illustration of uh, an old version of Nomad for a black box. So after all these displays, uh, you can see here the core of the uh, optimization. So the, in these two columns, you can see the number of black box evaluation and the current value of the objective function. So uh, after four evaluations here, uh, it, it could get to the first feasible point. And after 51 evaluations, he got uh, the best solution that he could. And he did a lot of evaluations, but none of them were successful after the, after the 51. So at the end, it gives you the, the point that, that was uh, generated during the 50, 51 evaluation. Um, so I, I wanted also to, uh, to present an example of uh, an application. So this is the uh, example of uh, hyperparameters optimization. It was a PhD project of uh, Dunia Lakneri. Uh, she is a postdoc now. And uh, this research is published in terms. So here we focus on the uh, hyperparameter optimization of deep neural networks. And in fact, um, it's very natural for Nomad to be applied here because uh, this is a black box optimization problem. So here, one black box evaluation consists to train and to validate and to test uh, a neural network with a fixed set of hyper, hyper parameters. So in this problem, we have a lot of categorical variables, such as the number of layers. And also this kind of variables, every time you change the value of one of these variables, it's going to change the number of variables of the problem. So it's a problem with a, a variable number of variables. Uh, and also, it, so far, the existing methods for this kind of problems are mostly heuristics, such as a random search, grid search, or genetic algorithms. So it was easy to beat. So it was a good time to, uh, to develop that. So it's based on Nomad, obviously, obviously. And this is the principle. So you have Nomad just here. You have the black box here, which consists to train, validate, and to test a neural network with a fixed set of hyperparameters. A point is a set of hyperparameters, and the objective to minimize or to maximize here is the accuracy of the network. And what we did is to uh, make an interface called HyperNomad that is going to uh, translate the nomad variables to the format of the neural networks, because we have a lot of uh, categorical variables we need a, a structure based on neighbors. So every time you change a value for one categorical variable, such as the, the type of optimizer, then you are good. Because these variables have no ordering, you have to specify to indicate what are the neighbors of these variables. So all this work is done with this interface called hypernomad. Um, so hypernomad is the interface between the nomad software and a deep learning platform. Here we use PyTorch, but it, it can work with some uh, data sets that are already integrated into PyTorch, uh, such, uh, such as uh, MNIST or CIFAR 10. Uh, we have a GitHub page for this, for this software, and we consider three types of hyperparameters. First, the ones that are related to the architecture of the neural network, the topology of the network, the hyperparameters that are re related to the optimizer, and one that is just one for the size of the mini batches for the training. So this is a table of the um, hyperparameters for the architecture of the network. So here we, we are dealing with the topology of the network. So the number of convolutional layers, the number of full layers, the dropout rate and the activation function. So uh, these are, uh, a variable number of variables because if you change n1 for example then you are going to for each new, new layer of uh, uh, neurons you need to define all these other parameters and these are the hyper parameters uh, related to the optimization to the training 
So there is one that is categorical, which is the uh, what is the type of optimizer. And for each, each uh, value, you have four more parameters. But these parameters are not the same. So in fact, depending on the value of the type of optimizer, you are not located in the same space. Here are some uh, first results that we had at the time. First on MNIST. So the database is for uh, recognizing uh, these uh, numbers from uh, zero to nine. And the uh, nomad did a good job, but in fact, every method does a good job on this uh, set because it's very simple. But uh, what is interesting is the speed of the, of the method, the convergence. So given uh, a fixed number of uh, evaluations for the number of times that we call the black box, it's very efficient. So here it's compared with uh, hyperopt, it's a Bayesian optimization method. Also with random search at the bottom. After that, we tried the method on a, on a more, uh, um, on a larger data set called the uh, CIFAR 10. So it's based on 40,000 images uh, for the training and uh, 10,000 images for the validation and the test. One evaluation of the black box takes two hours. So you, you give it a set of upper parameters and you go back two hours later to have a solution, to have an evaluation. Uh, so on the left, you can see the results from a default starting point. And uh, Nomad and Hypernomad are, are in red. And on the right, uh, this is a, an, another optimization from a different starting point, a better starting point. And here, uh, the blue method could not get anything working. In summary, uh, black box optimization is mostly motivated by industrial applications. All that we develop in Polytechnic since uh, 2000 and something, 2006, are backed by uh, publications in uh, mathematical and uh, optimization journals. We develop a software nomad that implements all that we find with the, with, in these papers. It's open source with a public license. We have many features into integrating into this software, like the dealing of constraints, the objective optimization, global optimizations, the use of surrogates, a lot of different types of variables and parallelism. Recently, we have this uh, interface called Hypernoma that is dedicated to uh, the hyperparameters optimization problem. Uh, because we have um, a full-time research associate that is working with us. We are, we are able to give a fast support for Nomad. And uh, this is what is uh, really appreciated in the community. In fact, so far uh, with, with time, uh, Nomad has become a baseline for benchmarking uh, derivative flow optimization methods. So it's not rare if you look into black box methods into derivative flow optimization methods. It's normally you are going to see Nomad somewhere in the, the list of uh, software to beat. Um, I'm going to give you my slides, and at the end, I, I, I've put a lot of references if you want to, to see that. Tim, this is all for me today. OK. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, I think we have uh, plenty of time for questions. So uh, please un unmute yourselves or write in the chat. Uh, I, can, I can kick it off if people are uh, a, little, uh, a little shy. So. Um, what I was curious uh, about in terms of the convert, like, what kind of convergence analysis do you have? And yeah. so what, what, what do the, I don't even know what the results will sound like, to be honest. Like, I mean, if, 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 I'm, if I'm testing or if I, if I have a convergence result for, for a standard optimization method, it will say, well, you will find a, a stationary point, uh, at least on a subsequence or, or things like this and under these conditions. So what are the conditions and what, what, what's the, so what, what are the theorems? Yeah, okay, what, what we have in fact is, a, uh, what, we, is a, what we call a hierarchical convergence theory. So okay. based on the, the levels of uh, hypothesis that you do on the nature of the problem. Okay. So if you consider first that, uh, that the black box is in fact a differentiable function, then it's guaranteed that the method is going to give you a stationary, stationary point where the gradient is zero with yeah. no constraints. Okay. Uh, in fact, even if you, um, if you execute a nomad on the, from a saddle point, it's not going to stop there. 
because it's not based on the gradient. Right. So it will, it will get, out, get out of a saddle point. Right. Uh, well, that's, of course, a very, <laughs> so, very current and desirable property. Yeah. Uh, but this is a, a this is a first step in the in the hierarchy of uh, results. After that, if you consider that you don't have a differentiable function, you can consider that you have a Lipschitz function. So in that case, you are going to end up with a, a local optimum, but based on the Clark derivatives. Ah, yeah. Okay. After that, uh, what you can prove is not much because you are you just have a black box. So. Sure. You can just say that you are going to produce a point that is going to be um, a local minimum given a set of neighbors, but not so much. But the fact is that with MAD, we have a set of dense directions. It means that if you converge to a point, there was no uh, descent direction from this point. Yeah, one, uh, maybe. Uh, I'll have a. I have another question, which is, is, is a bit different <laughs> than the, than the first one. Um, just out of curiosity, when you when you hyper uh, optimize the the neural nets, which was uh, the the optimization procedure which was usually found as 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 being optimal in the like you had a list like stochastic gradient, adder grad, atom. Uh, there, were there preferences that that I mean that's maybe a, a bit of a. No, I don't remember. Because you see, I, I see the problem as a black box. Yeah. As a black box. And uh, this is usually what we, the type of discussion that we have with, enge with engineers. So, uh, in fact, we, we discussed this with the uh, engineer related to the problem. But I, I, for this problem, I don't remember what was the, the best uh, optimizer. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, Sorry. It's kind of it's kind of a cool perspective to have the optimization method as a variable, like a categorical variable, if I understood that correctly. Yes, exactly. But you have to define your, your neighbors. Yeah. So what do, you, what do you have to do when you want to change the value of one of these variables? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, I, naively, when, when, when you started the talk, and I, actually before you started even the talk, and I, I was preparing for the seminar, I, I mean, the, the, the connection to, to, to neural networks is kind of almost natural. Because, yes. I mean, you, you, because, I mean, people are using neural nets as a black box also these days, right? I mean. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I, I must say that is, this is a field that is very difficult and new for me yeah. because all this community is in uh, computer science. Yeah. They use uh, Python a lot. Yeah, uh, and they publish in conferences, so it's very difficult for me to uh, to get a grasp of the literature, and it's so fast, and yeah. there are so many things. So, uh, but uh, it's why we we do this collaboration with uh, Huawei Canada. Yeah. So they get they give us uh, a very good expertise on the field. Yeah. So it's why we are going we are able now to uh, to be very efficient with this method because they they give us insight about the problem. Yeah, I think it's a really good field of applications for your stuff too. I mean, it's a, it should be really fruitful. Um, okay, enough from me. Uh, are there are there questions from from the audience? Yeah, I had a question. Um, so first, the curiosity, like computationally. Uh, sorry if you commented on that and, and I missed it, but like, how, what was the scale of, of of problems that nomads can deal with, like in terms of number of of variables of mm -hmm. the of inputs of the black box? Like, is there any bottleneck there or is like... Uh... Yes, yes, it is. Um, I, I would say that uh, you can go up to 50 variables easily. But okay. after that, you have to consider some decomposition methods. And we have some. We, we can do some parallelism based on sub-problems. So if you have 10 processes, you can distribute some sub-problems to these processes where you limit the number of variables and they are not going to consider all the variables every, every time they optimize. And in terms of outputs, um, in fact, this is not a bottleneck here. We have one or two objectives yeah. and uh, a bunch of constraints. But uh, in practice, uh, for large problems, there is no explosion with the number of outputs, but rather with the number of variables. Yeah, so, and this kind of brings me to, to a related question. So, linked to with what 
uh, team was asking before. So for the theory, are you able to kind of um, see this curse of dimensionality in the inputs perhaps with the theorems, like the theory point toward this limit or, uh, you know, where maybe you see some kind of exponential bow up with respect to the number of input variables in the, in the convergence you rates that you're able to prove stuff, stuff like that. Maybe the constants explode exponentially in the dimension. That's just a curiosity because it's oh, things that, I, that I'm really interested in. It's a very good point. In fact, um, so far, we don't have any theory related to the number of variables and the convergence. Okay. What we have is the nature of the point at the end. So we have global convergence to a local optimum, but the theory is not linked to the number of variables. So it can okay. take a lot of time be, before in practice getting, to, getting sort of yeah, such yeah, a point. Yeah. But some people did this kind of studies, but not for direct search, but for model-based method. Okay. So the next step for us is to, uh, in, in fact, one of these people is a new professor at Polytechnic. And uh, so that this is the first thing that we are going to do with this person is to, uh, to to take his study on the, of uh, the convergence based on the based on the number of variables and to try to apply that to our methods. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, and another more naive question. Sorry, maybe I really just missed it when you were explaining the the two D example where like we, there was the hierarchy of meshes and the directions. I, 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 you were saying we want to generate the directions so that kind of they they they're densely kind of uh, populate the whole. Uh, space. I was wondering, so I didn't understand if this was random, some kind of the, the direction of the selection of the directions. Is it randomized? Or yeah. it well, in fact, we have several methods okay. and one of them is uh, one of them is random, but uh, the, the most efficient that we have is based on the Alton seconds. Okay. And I, I never remember if, if it's pseudo-random or quasi-random because I always <laughs> mix the terms, <laughs> but uh, it's not random. It's uh, pseudo, pseudo or quasi-random. So something like modular arithmetic and the large primes? No, is it something like- Yeah, yeah, uh, not so large primes, but uh, yes, something like okay. that. Okay, okay, okay. But there is a pattern. There is a pattern in this uh, direction. So uh, we need to find a new sequence. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much for the- Talk. <laughs> uh, thanks for your questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there further questions from from the audience? If this is not the case, I would like to thank Sebastian again uh, very much for, for his presentation. Uh, thank you. I think that was really really well suited for for, for this uh, seminar. Uh, good overview talk and uh, interesting things to look up.